You've seen troops riding on tanks, being transported by trucks and jeeps, and even delivered by gliders towards their destination. But in some theaters of the war, there is a more cost-effective and simpler method of transport, the good old bicycle. I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II special episode about bicycles and bicycle troops. The story of the bicycle is one of success after success, from the invention of the running machine at the beginning of the 19th century to the more universal design at its end, which we recognize today. The addition of the pneumatic tire and the rubber tube, as well as a gearing and braking mechanism, made the bicycle very popular as a new personal method of transportation. It allowed people to cover distances much faster than walking on foot, and also made them independent from the schedules of public transportation or the expenses of a horse. Of course, as people began organizing bicycle clubs and sporting events, it didn't take long for military men to take notice. Often the question just revolved around, can we put a gun on that thing? But more level-headed strategists began thinking in terms of organization and mobility. The major advantages of using a bicycle during war are easy to see. Unlike a horse or a motor vehicle, the bicycle does not require water, fuel, or fodder. With a little care, rubber, lubricants, a bicycle can run for a long time. They're also comparatively cheap and easy to produce en masse. For nations that are already handicapped by lack of resources like oil, the bike is a feasible alternative means of transportation. Cycling soldiers don't get sore feet from marching, and they keep fit at the same time. Officers, in fact, remarked that despite staying hours on their bikes, the troops are still relatively fresh. There is also no great skill required to ride a bicycle, unlike learning to ride a horse or drive a tank. Once a man has learned to stay upright and keep his balance, there isn't that much more to it. On the move, the rider has a smaller profile than on a horse and is thus less noticeable from a distance. Cycles are also less noisy and do not throw up as much dust behind them as motor vehicles. If the cyclist encounters an obstacle in the terrain, a river or a bombed out road, he can simply pick up his bike and carry it over his shoulder. If he meets resistance along the way, a bicycle can be quickly dismounted and thrown into the bushes. And even a large number of bikes can be stored next to each other in a small space and guarded by only a handful of men or, or perhaps just one. No need to look after them like you'd have to with a bunch of horses. Of course, there are also a couple of disadvantages. The major one is that the bicycle relies on good terrain, and not only that, but on well-paved roads. A bicycle could never match the agility and versatility of a cavalryman in this regard. It cannot draw a heavy wagon or a cannon, and is pretty much useless in rugged terrain or cross-country. Also, trying to ride a bike into a charge with a saber and a lance looks quite silly, I think. The other obvious disadvantage is the vulnerability of bicycle troops. Groups of tightly packed cyclists are an optimal target for guns and shells, since they also move on predictable roads. Because of its size, low weight, and small frame, the bicycle can also not be used as a weapons platform or provide cover for the rider in any way. Soldiers have also said that trying to steer a bicycle while under fire is completely impossible. Designers have come up with special military bicycles outfitted with larger double-rimmed wheels, sturdier frames, or shock-absorbing springs. After all, those bikes need to keep up with the strain of carrying a fully equipped soldier or dragging little trailers loaded with 50-odd pounds of supplies. Then there are tandem bike designs for radio operators and their equipment. Others are outfitted with extra holdings to carry pigeons or, or telephone cables. One design is basically two bicycles connected with brackets to allow for a stretcher to be placed in the middle. Ideas of tricycles, quadricycles, and multicycles have all floated around, yet the standard two-wheeled bicycle has remained the most effective. All throughout Europe, Manufacturers like Opel, Peugeot, and Skoda began diversifying their production programs. Beyond sewing machines and small arms, 
They have been producing bicycles by the tens of thousands. Several designs have become quite popular, like the Italian Bianchi, German Schwalbe, Swedish Monarch, Niemanns, and Husqvarna models. Bicycles have, in fact, been used in virtually all major military conflicts of the 20th century so far. For the militaries of smaller European nations, the bicycle became the most cost-effective form of transportation during the interwar years. Many had neither the need nor the budget for a fleet of motorized vehicles, but did have a well-paved network of roads. Sweden and Denmark began replacing their cavalry squadrons with bicycle troops, and the Netherlands stockpiled 150,000 machines for two years of conscripts. Specialized wheeled sections were also employed by Finland, Norway, Poland, and Belgium. Light Jäger and Chasseurs divisions patrolled the frontiers, delivered messages, and kept an eye on the Germans. In case the Wehrmacht attacked, they would quickly use the speed and the mobility of their bicycles to take the bridges and contest positions along the waterways. When the Germans eventually did attack, they too committed extra bicycle formations, often attached as recon and medical detachments. After somewhat unexpectedly winning the Tour de France 1940, the Wehrmacht began not only seizing the guns and equipment of their defeated adversaries, but their bicycles as well. Not necessarily for frontline troops, but for units in the rear, military police, and occupational forces. Civilians in the occupied countries were usually allowed to keep theirs though, except for certain places like, like the Channel Islands, where possessing or even borrowing a bike was judged as sabotage and was punishable by prison time. Despite some international protest, Article 53 of the Hague Convention is not quite clear when it comes to the requisitioning of bicycles. On the occupied European continent, the bicycle has by now become a good tool for the resistance movements. People still need their bikes to go to work or go to school, so it's easy for a resistance fighter to blend in. They use them to deliver messages and smuggle people around, or even for hiding contraband inside the hollow tubes of the frame. Bicycles are considered much safer than public transport like buses or trains where people can be easily intercepted by German agents or police. The most famous use these days might be the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich where the Czechoslovak resistance reconnoitered suitable ambush locations via bicycle. The campaign against the Soviet Union has demonstrated the strategic limitations of the bicycle. Although Germany's allies in this fight all have fielded at least one rapid core, including bicycle formations, the Soviet countryside is not suited for their employment. There are barely any paved roads and the distances are simply too great. Perhaps, if the war turns against Germany and Germany's allies and fuel resources become depleted, the bicycle can play a larger role once again. Time will tell. One country that has fully embraced the popularity of the bicycle is Japan. By the mid-1930s, one out of eight Japanese owned one of the designs manufactured by Miata and Fuji. Military youth organizations gave volunteers not only uniforms and training, but their own bikes as well. By 1940, an estimated 50,000 bicycles had been shipped for the war in China and Japanese bicycle companies played a major role in Japan's quick seizure of the Dutch East Indies and French Indochina. In fact, capturing the rubber resources of the Dutch East Indies was a vital war aim to keep bicycle deployment viable. As the war in Asia has widened, the Japanese have begun using a wide variety of different types of bikes as they have simply seized every cycle from every village they come across. They can have as many as 6,000 machines in one division. This has led to the nickname, the Pedaling Army. Japanese bicycle troops may ride up to 20 hours a day until tires become worn thin and shredded but it is something of a myth that the troops purposefully ride on the steel rims. This is only done out of necessity and actually makes such a noise that Allied soldiers have thought they're about to encounter Japanese tanks. Each bicycle company, however, is usually assigned a two-man team of bicycle mechanics to quickly repair damaged rims and fix punctured tires. 
campaign across the Malaysian peninsula was the high watermark of bicycle troops in the east so far. The well-paved road network allowed them to move independently and quickly traverse the Johor Strait towards Singapore, often overtaking the retreating Allied troops. Afterwards, there haven't been many such places for bicycle troops to be as useful, yet it has often been the rule that wherever the Japanese soldier goes, he takes his prized possession, his bicycle, with him, even to remote garrisons on small spots of sand in the South Pacific. So it's not uncommon to see bicycles strewn around those battlefields as well. Because the major allies can rely on a much larger pool of vehicles and resources, they usually do not feel such need to equip their frontline troops with bicycles. Bicycles are, however, suited for other important roles. For example, by 1939, the British people owned around 10 million bikes. These became the primary method of transport for a whole lot of home front organizations. The local defense volunteers of the Home Guard, the Red Cross, fire and police service, women's land army, air raid wardens, and so on, all traveled by bicycle through cities and the countryside. And that is often quite dangerous in blackout conditions. An exception is BSA Company, which began looking into producing special bicycles solely for airborne troops. Since paratroopers lack heavy equipment and mobility after landing, it was thought that a new foldable parabike might be useful. It was to weigh no more than 22 pounds, since it was attached to the parachutist by a rope and needed to run reliably for at least 50 miles. Although both the 1st and 6th Airborne Divisions have been outfitted with such parabikes, they have not yet been deployed so far during the war. Not now in 1943, anyhow. The Soviet Union undertook similar experiments for their airborne units in 1941, but these designs were ultimately scrapped after the German invasion. The US military as well has looked into emulating British and German designs and experiments with bicycles, starting with the Victory Bike program, and even taking control of the bicycle industry last year. But as opposed to how it has been popularly presented, this has mostly been canceled and has not been a success and has even hobbled the American bicycle industry. You can look that up yourself for more details. This here has been the general story of the bicycle in World War II so far. It is a vehicle that is reliable, cheap, and practical, yet without any combat value in and of itself. The answer to that early question, can you put a gun on it, is a pretty strong no. But when they are in their element, bicycles have proven not just effective, but necessary. And what can I say? It's a bike. It's always gonna come in handy. If you want to see another cool special about vehicles that sometimes get overlooked, check out this one about the Higgins boat and join the Time Ghost Army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com to get even more specials about well, all sorts of things, you know? Time Ghost Army, that's what makes it happen. See you next time. Mm -hmm.